to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast thy poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you that we can meet together this way. We ask your blessings upon the service. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated and let's sing another song. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair, when the save of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, When the roll is going yonder, when the roll is going yonder, I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen one shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is going yonder, 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 I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Well, we appreciate you all being here and those watching live stream. We'll be live streaming once again this evening at 7 o'clock, Lord willing, and then Lord willing, uh, Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. 
And then uh, those in the auditorium, uh, if you choose, we have an offering plate uh, on the organ in the front. You may leave your tithes, offerings, or missions giving there. And those who choose and are willing to uh, help uh, with the ministry of the church, we certainly appreciate that. And uh, you can uh, send uh, a tithe or offering or missions giving to uh, the, the address on, on the screen, First Baptist Church, and then Attention Financial Secretary. We're going to have another song, and then we're going to look into God's Word this morning. Right now, uh, you should uh, have uh, your, your sheet of papers, and we're going to sing, There is Power in the Blood. So let's stand together, and after we sing, we'll remain standing for prayer, then uh, we'll look into God's word this morning. Right now, let's stand together. There is power in the blood. Amen. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's one in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb would you be free from your passion and pride there's power in the blood power in the blood Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in his life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, there is power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power and remain standing for prayer lord we just thank you for the opportunity to open the word of god holy spirit please take the word in power and minister to each and every heart fill me with thy spirit we pray in jesus name amen, amen. you may be seated and if you have your uh, bibles you may want to turn with me to uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. Ephesians, chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 17. The Bible says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. When we read passages like this, if you just read them uh, 
it's hard to figure them out unless you take time and uh, break down the passage, break down the verses, get the context in order to get the message that God is, is uh, trying to uh, get to us. And so with that in mind, I want you to look at verse number 19, Ephesians 4, verse number 19, it says this, who being past feeling, who being past feeling. Now the Apostle Paul is speaking here to believers, but he's not talking about believers here when it says who being past feeling. He's actually speaking about unsaved people. He's warning believers, though, not to allow sin and not to allow sinning to characterize their walk. The unsaved does not have the ability in themselves to do the right thing. You say, well, I know people who are unsaved and uh, they do a lot of good things. Yes, but uh, they don't have in themselves the ability to consistently do the right thing. What I mean is there's no hope for this world to raise its moral standards. If you think uh, the days are going to get better, uh, you're mistaken. According to the word of God, things are going to grow worse and worse and worse. Things that people do today uh, would shock our grandparents and our great-grandparents. They wouldn't believe uh, what's being accepted today, even in uh, Christianity. So he's saying to them, I don't want you to be like other Gentiles who are lost. I don't want you to be like other Gentiles who are blinded and have literally gotten to the place where they're, they're past feeling. I don't want you to get there where they feel nothing spiritually uh, anymore or don't have any feeling towards spiritual things. When the Apostle Paul uses the words being past feeling, he's not speaking of someone who's so spiritually mature as a Christian that they don't operate by feelings anymore. But he's referring to a degraded spiritual state. He's talking about someone who has become so calloused that they don't come under conviction or have any feelings of guilt when they do wrong. There's a lot of people who get to that place. They uh, get to the place where now uh, they do wrong, but it doesn't bother them at all. They've become so cold-hearted that nothing moves them. And the Apostle Paul is warning Christians about this thing. See, even God's people can get to a place where they no longer uh, feel conviction. They no longer are, uh, feel guilt about something they do. We need to be careful about that. The verse says, who pass, who being past feeling. The Apostle Paul is describing here again a tragic condition. It's a danger he's warning these Ephesian believers about. He's telling them, you better be careful lest you get to the place where you are so calloused, where you're so cold, where you're so dead, so indifferent that you don't even feel any kind of spiritual conviction when you do wrong. God's warning all of us about that. Did you ever hear someone say, I know the Bible says it, but I just don't feel convicted about that yet. There's a lot of people who have said that to me. Now, if you're saved and the Bible is being preached and what you're doing or not doing is in violation to the Word of God, then why wouldn't you feel conviction? We should, shouldn't we? If we're saved and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, if we do wrong or if we're not doing what we should do and we hear that being taught and preached, we should feel conviction. 
In the Bible, there's a reference to people who have been under conviction, describing them as being cut to the heart. That's another way of being under conviction. In Acts chapter 5, the apostle Peter and the other apostles were preaching to the high priest and to the council. And in Acts 5, verse number 33, the Bible says, when they heard that, they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. When someone's cut to the heart, that means they're feeling something. Now, God never intended for a saved person to live by feelings. We should never live by feelings. But also, we're never intended to be by the Lord as saved people to get to the place where we're so insensitive that we have no feeling. We're not to live by feelings, but we are to have feelings. God never intended for a saved person to get so calloused where he cannot get excited about the Word of God, where he cannot get excited about spiritual things. So the Apostle Paul talks about being past feeling. But then he said, once they get past feeling, they give themselves over to lasciviousness. Ephesians 4, 19 again, the Bible says, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work uncleanness with greediness. Lasciviousness is just a big word which simply means giving in to fleshly appetites, giving in to fleshly desires. This verse tells us that once someone gets spiritually calloused, they just give themselves over to the lust of the flesh without any conviction or feeling of guilt. Galatians 5, 17 says this, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse number 15, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. So whom one yields his members to, that's whose servant he is. My members, speaking of my body, can be instruments of righteousness or instruments unto sin and unto godliness. So when a saved person gets to the place where he doesn't feel conviction or guilt anymore, he then just goes through the motions, doing his religious duty, but giving up the fight and even giving in to fleshly appetites and fleshly desires. We need to be careful about that. Then the unrestrained flesh takes over, causing the individual to do even shocking things. Yes, even save people can do shocking things, practicing uncleanness. So here again, Ephesians 4, verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. That is, he wants more and more and more. He's greedy. He wants more of it and more of it, and more of it. Yes, speaking of the unsaved, but using it to warn the saved. So it's not just one move that brings people down to that point, but it begins with not having any feeling towards spiritual things anymore, or right or wrong. The Bible gives several examples of this downward progression. For instance, Psalm 1, verse 1. 
The Bible says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The first thing a person does is put himself under the counsel or under the influence of the ungodly. He exposes himself to the advice of the ungodly. Christian, saved person, be careful who you take advice from, especially if it's an unsaved person. I heard of people who went for marriage counseling and they went to a counselor who was divorced three times. Uh, I don't know if I would want to take his advice. And then that person ends up taking his stand after listening to the counsel of the ungodly. He takes his stand with sinners. That is, after one listens to them, he starts defending them feeling sorry for them, especially when the preacher gets up and preaches against what they're doing. Then the final step in this downward progression is that he becomes a scorner. That is, he mocks and scorns those for doing right. But nobody starts out with the final step. It's a progression. In Genesis chapter 34, the Bible tells us that Jacob's daughter, Dinah, went out to see the daughters of the land. That's where she made her first mistake. She should have had nothing to do with the pagan, with the unsaved people. And yet, because of her curiosity, she went out to uh, investigate. And a young man took her and defiled her. She losing her virtue. I don't want to give the whole story. You can read it yourself. But because of her reckless decision, a lot of bad things happened. But if she hadn't gone out to see the daughters of the land, and if she hadn't been so interested in what they were doing, many problems for her and her family wouldn't have occurred. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 2 says this, learn not the way of the heathen. You hear that? Learn not the way of the heathen. That is, I don't need to be too well educated in what the unsaved worldly crowd is doing. The Apostle Paul told the saved people in Rome in Romans 16 verse 19, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. That means I don't need to study evil too well and know too much about the mechanics of it. To know it's evil is enough. How many parents say, uh, I'm going to let my children go out there and, and get a taste of the world so they'll learn? That's foolish. That's very, very foolish. That's a terrible thing. To know it's evil is enough. But this all begins when a saved person gets to the place where he's one of those religious zombies, being past feeling. Some of our church people show up 10 to 15 minutes late for church. And then they plop down on the pew because they're supposed to be there on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night. But it seems that their heart is no longer in it. It seems as if they're no longer excited about the things of God and the preaching of the Word of God. I know I used this illustration before, but it fits uh, so well he at this time. You heard the story about the fella who died in the back pew of the church. They called 911 for somebody to come and get him. They had to remove five people before they got to the real corpse. That's how many safe people are. They're not excited about anything anymore, even the preaching of the Word of God. Now, while it's true, 
that a child of God is not to operate by feelings. We're not to operate by feelings, but it's a disaster to be past feeling. God didn't tell me, do what you feel like doing. But he did say, do what the Bible says. And if I stay close to God, there will be feelings attached to it. And if our feelings are contrary to the scriptures, we're to rather obey the Bible than our feelings. If we don't like doing something, and the Bible says we're to do it, then we're to do it anyway. So I'm not supposed to let my feelings govern me, but I'm supposed to have feelings. God created man an emotional creature. And do not our emotions cause us to feel some things? To feel grief? To feel sorrow? To feel joy? To feel guilt? To feel conviction? To feel excitement? We feel because we were created emotional beings. But the truth is, there are a lot of saved people who are practically dead emotionally. They don't feel anything anymore. Nothing excites them. Many sit under the preaching, but never get under conviction, or at least they never respond. Now, there are two kinds of feelings mentioned in the Word of God. There's what's called sensuality. Sensuality. Sensuality has to do with what a person can experience in his flesh. What I can feel with my hands, what I can taste, what I can hear, what I can see, and what I can smell. I'm now talking about what my flesh can feel, what my flesh can experience in some kind of sinful or emotional way when it comes to sensuality. But God tells me that I'm to do always with, uh, with uh, what the Word of God teaches and do away with those kinds of feelings that come because of sensuality or because of sensual uh, uh, feelings. In fact, he calls it inordinate affection in another place in Scripture. In Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5, uh, it's called inordinate affection because it's out of line with the ordinances of God. Anything that's contrary to the Word of God is inordinate affection. It's out of line with godly principle. It's out of line with the Scriptures. And when my feelings are in violation with the Scriptures, I'm supposed to mortify them. That is, I'm to put those feelings to death. I'm talking about inordinate affections. I'm talking about sensuality. So I'm not to be dead altogether, but I'm to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God. Romans 6 verse 11 says this, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then also, there's a, lots of folks that are dead to sin, but they're also dead to God. They may not be living in outright sin, but they're not doing anything for God either. They're only spectators. They come to watch the show. But we're not here for entertainment. But we're here to get the word of God to people and equip them to do the will of God. And God does expect us to be doers of his word. James 1 verse 22, the Bible says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. So whatever God says, 
we're to do it no matter how we feel. So whatever God says, that's how it ought to be. God did, did again, make us emotional creatures. But there are such things as worldly feelings as we just described. And again, that's called sensuality. But then there's also a spiritual zeal or fervor that saved people should have accompanied by godly feelings. Feelings like what? Feelings like peace and joy and contentment and satisfaction. Those are the feelings that God wants us to experience. And there should also be guilt feelings for the saved person when he does wrong. I'm supposed to have that also. In fact, that's proper and healthy for me as a saved person to have guilt feelings when I'm doing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. And thank God for those feelings of guilt because I need that to straighten me out. And so God never intended for saved people to get past feeling. And the truth of the word of God is uh, that it should cause every saved person to feel certain emotions. And then those feelings should cause us to make decisions to straighten out the matter that God's convicting us about. If God convicts me, if I'm having a feeling of guilt because of what the Word of God says, and I'm doing the opposite or I'm not doing what I should be doing, there should be conviction. There should be guilt. And again, I thank God for it. In fact, the Bible preaching should create feelings that will cause the saved person to draw closer to God. I'm glad that I can still feel bad and feel guilt when I do the wrong things. I thank God for that. I'm glad I still feel Holy Spirit conviction when I hear preaching. I'm glad that I can still feel God's peace in the midst of the storms of life. I'm glad I can still feel compassion for those in need and those who are suffering. I'm glad I can still grieve over things that ought to be grieved over. I thank God for those feelings. I'm glad I still get stirred in the depths of my soul when I hear the national anthem played or when I hear God bless America. It just gives me chills. I thank God for that. Ephesians 4, 19 again, the Bible says, being past feeling, being past feeling. But Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, puts it another way. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. 2 Timothy chapter 3, in fact, the first five verses, it talks about the same thing. 2 Timothy 3 verse 5 says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Did you ever hear someone say, you can be saved, but you don't have to go to church. You can be saved, but you could still stay out of church. But though that statement may be true, if you are saved, explain to me why you don't want to go to church to be with God's people. Explain to me why you're not interested in going to church. You say you're saved. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. Explain to me why you're not excited about the opportunity to go to church. It sounds to me like if you are saved, you're past feeling or you're heading that way. It sounds to me like your love is waxing cold. It sounds to me like you have the form, but not the substance. Have you ever walked on the seashore and noticed all those shells? Pick one up 
and examine it. You have the form in your hand, but the life is gone out of it. And many saved people have religious form. They have religious formality, but they actually don't feel anything because all they have is the form. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Sounds to me like a description of someone being past feeling. Jeremiah talks about the people in his day who no longer blushed. They didn't feel embarrassed anymore. Sounds like our day, 2020. Some being past feeling. Sin has become too normal for us. We're no longer shocked at the presence of sin, even in our own lives and even in our own families. I was recently speaking to a woman who was a, a professional woman, and she told me that her son had a girlfriend, and they were living together. And she talked like it was the greatest thing that ever happened, and she went on and said this to me. She said, I can't wait till they come and visit us we have a room all set aside for them. We're talking about people who are living in sin and not married. The Bible has a lot to say about marriage. Just take time to study the Bible and you'll find how God talks so much about marriage. But yet this woman was so excited that she even had a room for her son and his girlfriend. That's terrible. I'll tell you what, I, I, I'm sure the, the woman's not saved because I, I know her and I have spoken to her on more than one occasion. But if she is, she's certainly past feeling. And that's a bad place to be as saved people. And so sin has become so normal and too normal to many of us then why are some past feeling? Some are past feeling because, as it was mentioned in a previous scripture, they have a seared conscience. They have a seared conscience. Some are past feeling because of that. Many saved people are somewhat like that. They hear preaching, and they resisted the conviction of the Holy Spirit too many times. Now they're numb to it. So now it doesn't bother them anymore. They're past feeling. Then there are those who have the form. They just go through the, emo the emotions, not being moved at all. They're past feeling. Now the truth is, a feeling is the difference between something being a cumbersome duty, or a delight. But nonetheless, God's people shouldn't need a feeling to do right. But when God's people do right, they'll get a feeling. They'll get a good feeling. So then, how do we deal with being past feeling if that's where we presently are, or if that's where we're presently heading? How do we deal with it? Psalm 39, verse number 3. The Bible says, While I was musing, the fire burned. Get a hold of that verse as we close. While I was musing, the fire burned. The word muse means to meditate. God's people are to meditate on God and His Word. We need to set time aside to
to get into God's word, meditate on God's word, meditate on God. I think of the disciples as they were walking on the Emmaus Road. The resurrected Lord Jesus appeared to them in Luke chapter 24. After he left, they said this in Luke 24 verse 32. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? A big reason why there's no spiritual flame within many is simply because we're too busy to spend time with God in his word and in closet prayer fellowshipping and communing with God. The thing that keeps the fire in the soul and keeps the feeling in one's life is one's relationship with Jesus Christ. So it all boils down to our devotional life. There's the key right there to keep from getting to the place of being past feeling, which leads to giving up the fight and giving in to the flesh. And so, those of us who are saved, I say this to you and to me, let's never get to the place where we're past feeling when it comes to sin, when it comes to doing wrong. So therefore, the necessity for daily Bible reading and study daily Bible reading and study, the necessity for daily closet prayer, and the necessity to not live flesh by fleshly impulses or feelings, but in obedience to God's word. And then those who are still unsaved, it's time now for you to open the door of your heart and invite Jesus Christ in to be your personal Savior. And by the way, if you do that, call the church and I'll send you some helpful material for your own spiritual growth in the Lord. But thank God for feelings. But let's not let feelings control us, especially when they're sensual feelings. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for the word of God. I pray that you would use this Bible message to minister to the hearts of those who are saved. Dear God, we ought to be thankful for our salvation every day. We ought to be thankful for how good you are to us. Amen. Because none of us have any right to complain, no matter what's going on in our lives. To thee be the glory. And then, dear God, I pray for the unsaved. Let them understand that they're sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And a penalty has to be paid. That's hell, the lake of fire. But God in his love sent Jesus to pay the penalty that we owe and whosoever shall call upon the Lord, name of the Lord shall be saved. Dear God, open the hearts of the unsaved and may they call upon you to be their personal savior, the only one they're gonna depend on from now on to be forgiven and go to heaven when they die. Have your way, dear God, during the invitation as those in the auditorium may need to come to the altar and say, God, the flame is lowering. Please rekindle it. God, send revival to my heart. Stir my heart. Help me. Dear God, have your way now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand Amen. together, and uh, if you need to come to the altar now, you may come. Let's sing together, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way.
have thy own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and 